I think we're going to get started. First of all, um, my name's Kate Eichhorn. I'm the Dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies, and um, Gina Walker is my esteemed colleague. I actually met Gina many years ago at the beginning of my career at a conference on feminist history at Brown, and I was thrilled when years later I was hired at the new school and found out that I would be colleagues with Gina. Um, as many of you know, Gina is one of the most important feminist historians uh, in this country. She spent years doing incredibly important work, but also really supporting younger feminist scholars and writers. And tonight's event, I think, is really exemplary of the reasons why we all are so appreciative of Gina's work. So thank you, Gina, for organizing this event, but also for all of your other contributions. Um, you probably have already seen that there's something on your seat. So without further ado, um, we're going to start the event by explaining what we're supposed to fill out on the cards. All right. Good evening. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'll be very, very brief. I'm the uh, new historian's handyman. Um, <laughs> and. I have three things to explain for tonight. Um, the first is that you are likely sitting on um, an article uh, by Elizabeth Winkler that appeared in The New Yorker about Ed Hedwana. Um, and Gina thought it would be incredibly appropriate to share that article with you all um, because it, in a lot of ways, embodies um, this, the kind of historiographical <laughs> struggle to understand women's contributions to knowledge. So um, that's all there as a treat for you all. Um, Second of all, there is uh, one of these and a pencil. Uh, and so if uh, what we'd like to do is um, at the, once they're sort of done with their part of the show, um, we'll collect questions that you're going to write onto this. I will collect them, and then I'll sift through them and ask them. Um, uh, you know, uh, good penmanship, that's number one. Um, so write clearly if you want to have your question asked. Uh, I have terrible handwriting. so. Um, uh, I'm not going to ask my own question, but um, if you will sort of collect all of that. So if you think of a question along the way, um, we'll frame the questions that way. And finally, um, and kind of uh, most exciting, is that if you haven't seen already, we are selling um, Elizabeth Winkler's magnificent book outside. Um, so immediately after, uh, there will be uh, people at the desk there. And um, it's my job to inform you that everyone has to buy a copy, <laughs> possibly two. And, um, I have a bandage on my nose because I'm willing to fight for this. So um, don't uh, don't forget to purchase a copy when you leave. It's an opportunity in the holiday seasons coming up to buy two or three. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to this amazing panel. It's really one. Can you hear me? People usually can't, but I think with this they should be able to. It's really thrilling to have you all here. Um, we have planned this for a long time. Lots of people in the audience have worked on it. And it's the first public event that the New Historia has done since before the pandemic. But Elizabeth Winkler's book, Shakespeare Was a Woman, simply demanded that we create a panel and talk about it together and talk about it with you. So I'll introduce my quite marvelous colleagues. Nancy Kendrick is professor of philosophy at Wheaton College. And she is one of, don't blanch when I say this, just hold steady. She is one of the women who is doing the most exciting work recovering, discovering, and reclaiming the women who actually were, have been philosophers for a very, very long time, and contextualizing them so that we know what they have to teach us today. Namitha Luthra is a women's rights attorney, as she styles herself, very, very active, and so thoughtful as you will hear. So she is also on the board of advisors of the new Historia. And I have, um, at long distance, lived with Elizabeth through 
the writing of this book. I mean, her struggles, I'm afraid, were her own. But I think it is a dazzling expression and performance of how hard it is to get to the truth about anything and how crucially important, especially today. So Elizabeth, please take it away. Well, thank you so much, Gina. Thank you to all of you for joining me here this evening. I'm, I'm really very touched to be here. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about Shakespeare. The Shakespeare authorship question, the theory that William Shakespeare might not have written the works published under his name, is the most horrible, vexed, unspeakable subject in the history of English literature. Among scholars, even the phrase Shakespeare authorship question elicits contempt, eye-rolling, name-calling, mud-slinging. If you raise it casually in a social setting, someone might chastise you as though you've uttered a deeply offensive profanity. Someone else might get up and leave the room. Tears may be shed, a whip may be produced. You will be punished, which is to say educated, because it is obscene to suggest that the god of English literature might be a false god. It is heresy. Now this is curious because some of our greatest writers and thinkers have suspected that the name was indeed a pseudonym for a concealed writer. The Renaissance was a great age of assumed names. And um, literary history is full of writers who concealed their authorship. Henry James wrote, I am sort of haunted by the conviction that the divine William is the biggest and most successful fraud ever practiced on the patient world. Whitman agreed, we all know how much mythos there is in the Shakespeare question he wrote. Mark Twain uh, was of a, of a similar mind. So far as anybody actually knows and can prove, Shakespeare of Stratford never wrote a play in his life, Twain wrote. All the rest of his history, as furnished by the biographers, is built up course upon course of guesses, inferences, theories, conjectures, an Eiffel Tower of artificialities rising sky high. For Vladimir Nabokov, the mystery inspired a poem. You easily, regretlessly relinquished the laurels concealing for all time your monstrous genius beneath a mask, he wrote. Reveal yourself, god of iambic thunder, you hundred-mouthed, unthinkably great bard. I've come to see the authorship question as a metaphor for the problem of history, of how we know what we think we know about the past. It's also a metaphor for the problem of authority. Who has the authority to determine the truth about the past? In England in 1964, the authorship question came before the courts. It's a fascinating, little-known case, and I'd like to tell you about it briefly. So cast your minds, if you will, back to the summer of 1964. A woman named Miss Evelyn May Hopkins had died, leaving a third of her inheritance to the Francis Bacon Society for um, the purpose of discovering the original manuscripts of Shakespeare's plays. Now, her aim in finding the manuscripts was to prove that Francis Bacon, the Elizabethan philosopher and statesman, was the true author of the works attributed to Shakespeare. Her heirs were not pleased. Naturally, they wanted the money for themselves. So, seeking to reclaim their inheritance, they brought a suit against the, Bacon, the Francis Bacon Society um, on the grounds that Ms. Hopkins' bequest would be a wild goose chase. To support their case, they solicited the testimony of scholarly experts, the right honorable Richard Wilberforce, a justice of Her Majesty's High Court presided. Counsel for the next of kin describe it as a wild goose chase, but wild geese can, with good fortune, be apprehended, observed the justice. Many discoveries are unlikely until they are made. One may think of the tomb of Tutankhamun or the Dead Sea Scrolls, he pointed out. Having reviewed the evidence submitted to the court, Wilberforce summarized it as follows. The orthodox opinion which at the present time is unanimous, or nearly so, among scholars in 16th century literature, is that the plays were written by William Shakespeare of Stratford, actor. However, he continued, the evidence in favor of Shakespeare's authorship is quantitatively slight. It rests positively in the main on the explicit statements in the first folio of 1623, that's the collection of Shakespeare's plays that turns 400 this year, negatively on the lack of any challenge to this ascription at the time. Furthermore, the justice found, there are a number of difficulties in the way of the traditional ascription, a number of known facts that are difficult to reconcile. For example, when Shakespeare died, he left 
a will with detailed instructions for the distribution of his assets, but mentioned no poems, plays, or manuscripts of any kind. At his death, only half of the plays had been published. Did he have no concern for their preservation? Why didn't he say anything about his poems? Several major narrative poems, 154 sonnets. So far from these difficulties tending to diminish with time, the intensive search of the 19th century, noted the justice, has widened the evidentiary gulf between Shakespeare the man and the author of the plays. He went on to consider the testimony of the scholarly experts. Kenneth Muir, professor of English at the University of Liverpool, supported the plaintiffs, Ms. Hopkins' aggrieved heirs. He considered it certain that Bacon could not have written the works of Shakespeare. Hugh Trevor Roper, professor of history at Oxford, departed slightly from his English literature colleagues, taking what the justice deemed a more cautious line. Though Professor Trevor Roper definitely does not believe that the works of Shakespeare could have been written by Francis Bacon, he also considers that the case for Shakespeare rests on a narrow balance of evidence, and that new material could upset it. That though almost all professional scholars accept Shakespeare's authorship, a settled scholarly tradition can inhibit free thought. That heretics are not necessarily wrong. His conclusion is that the question of authorship cannot be considered as closed. Justice Wilberforce agreed the question was not closed. The evidence for Shakespeare was too slim, the problems too many, the scholars might be wrong. Even if Francis Bacon was unlikely, new material might show someone other than Shakespeare to have been the author. Indeed, he added, to the consternation of the plaintiffs and the Shakespeare scholars, the revelation of a manuscript would contribute, probably decisively, to a solution to the authorship problem, and this alone is benefit enough. So Ms. Hopkins' bequest to the Francis Bacon Society was upheld. The 1964 trial did not rule directly on the authorship question, did he or didn't he, but it raised the problem of authority. Were the Shakespeare scholars called to testify to the traditional attribution in support of Ms. Hopkins' irritated heirs infallible? Was it possible that heretics, non-specialists, might be right? Behind the observations that a settled scholarly tradition can inhibit free thought and heretics are not necessarily wrong, lay the whole history of knowledge, of truth perverted by confirmation bias and groupthink, of scholars clinging to outdated theories, contemptuous of ideas that threaten their authority, of long-held certainties rendered quaint by new knowledge, of entire fields revolutionized by heresy, the trial had the effect of displacing the authority of the scholars, making them mere witnesses, biased, partial, and putting the truth in the hands of the court, which concluded, in fact, that the truth was not certain. Now, in 2023, questioning an expert's authority feels exceedingly uncomfortable. It puts people in mind of COVID deniers and other bad actors who have weaponized just asking questions. We're generally better off trusting experts. At the same time, it remains true that authorities aren't always right. Geologists ridiculed Alfred Wegener's theory of continental drift for decades before accepting it. Historians insisted that Thomas, Thomas Jefferson didn't father children by his slave, Sally Hemings, until DNA evidence proved that he did. Academia is vulnerable to groupthink, a phenomenon of social psychology in which a group maintains cohesion by agreeing not to question unproven core assumptions and excluding anyone who deviates from group doctrine. Scholars seek approval of leaders in their fields, department chairs, journal editors, peer reviewers. They fear rejection. These dynamics encourage conformity. And though Shakespeare scholars have interpretive differences, they adhere to a fundamental set of common beliefs, their core belief being the traditional theory of authorship. Yet in private, some scholars will quietly admit doubts. Yes, of course Shakespeare could have been a pen name or a scam or a committee of Bacon, Marlowe, Oxford, Neville, one professor wrote to me, listing a few of the other candidates. As we exchanged emails, it seemed this professor was perfectly fine with letting Shakespeare be seen as the author, even if he knew it might not be true. I think we've got a big enough task in figuring out what the plays are doing in themselves, he explained although I wondered if knowing more about their author wouldn't help with that. Shakespeare is a mystery that scholars cannot explain, 
Shakespeare's knowledge of classics and philosophy has always puzzled his biographers, admitted the scholar E.K. Chambers. A few years at the Stratford Grammar School do not explain it. Others have tried to resolve the puzzle by downplaying Shakespeare's erudition. The plays merely looked learned, especially to the less literate public, insisted Harvard's Alfred Harbage. But the plays have sent scholars writing whole books on the law in Shakespeare, medicine in Shakespeare, theology in Shakespeare, Shakespeare in astronomy, Shakespeare in music, Shakespeare in Italy, Shakespeare in the French language. The creative artist absorbs information from the surrounding air, Harbage assured his readers, floating a theory of education by osmosis. Throwing up his hands, Samuel Schoenbaum, one of the 20th century's leading scholars, resolved the conundrum by explaining that Shakespeare was superhuman, an explanation that is, of course, no explanation at all. <laughs> the mystery inspires our awe. It's part of what we love about Shakespeare, part of what, in fact, makes Shakespeare Shakespeare. He satisfies our need for the sacred, for something that surpasses our ability to understand. In the West generally, and in Britain in particular, Shakespeare functions as a secular god. Pilgrims began flocking to Stratford in the 18th century to pay homage to the poet. They dropped to their knees at the birthplace, the purported site of his nativity. They sang odes to Shakespeare, untouched and sacred be thy shrine, Avonian willy, bard divine. By the mid-19th century, English departments began to develop, and ideas about Shakespeare that were enshrined during this period of extreme veneration have been passed down from one generation of scholars to the next. This may be why the authorship question has taken on the emotional, fanatical veneer of a religious war. No one takes kindly to the denial of his god. Professor Stanley Wells, one of Britain's leading Shakespeareans, declared a few years ago, it is immoral to question history and take credit away from William Shakespeare of Stratford. Immoral to question history, I love that, when uh, inquiry is the very basis of the historical discipline. Instead of engaging with the argument, scholars tend to launch these ad hominem attacks. And I've sat down with eminent Shakespeare scholars who couldn't offer alternative explanations for evidence that Shakespeare was a pseudonym because they hadn't even um, engaged with it, hadn't, weren't familiar with it. This book is partly a work of literary history, the history of this strange uh, centuries-long feud over the god of English literature. It's also a work of journalism, and you'll find interviews in the book with um, leading Shakespeare scholars, Stanley Wells, Stephen Greenblatt, Marjorie Garber. I went to the Folger Shakespeare Library in DC to read the correspondence of Professor James Shapiro, an arch defender of the faith, and Justice John Paul Stevens, um, the late Supreme Court Justice, uh, a, a leading skeptic. And it's a fascinating exchange on the authorship between um, a Shakespearean and one of our, our greatest legal minds. To me, a lot of this story ends up being a comedy. The religious war over Shakespeare is hilarious. It's absurd. In this, it resembles the, um, the comedies of mistaken identity, you know, the plays themselves. There's something uncannily Shakespearean about the Shakespeare authorship question. Mistaken identities abound in Shakespeare. Reputations are false. Appearances are not what they seem. Um, the apparent Viola in Twelfth Night is not the real Viola. The apparent Iago in Othello is not the real Iago. Is the apparent author the real author, the Harvard scholar Marjorie Garber asks, is the official version to be trusted? In the end, this is also a romance. All of these people are in love with Shakespeare or whoever they think Shakespeare was. And fundamentally, it's a detective story. Was it Francis Bacon, as Ms. Hopkins suspected? In 1603, Bacon wrote a letter um, to a lawyer writing to meet the new king, James I, and, and he signed off saying, um, so desiring you to be good to concealed poets. Very mysterious sign off. Who was this concealed poet he was referring to? Was it, was it Bacon himself? Was it Christopher Marlowe, a playwright and government agent who disappeared in 1593, reportedly murdered just weeks before Shakespeare emerged? What about William Stanley, the sixth Earl of Derby, a Jesuit spy sent in 1599 to probe whether the Earl might advance the Catholic cause in England, reported back that he was busied only in penning comedies for the common players, but no comedies under the Earl of Derby's name have ever been found. Was it Edward de Vere, 
far and away the favorite candidate today, alternative candidate, the eccentric 17th Earl of Oxford, who traveled in the very areas of northern Italy which with, with which the plays seem most familiar. A theory of group authorship has arisen too. And is it possible a woman was involved? Many readers over the years have felt something weirdly female about Shakespeare. In 1664, the philosopher Margaret Cavendish wrote, one would think Shakespeare has metamorphosed from a man to a woman, for who could describe Cleopatra better than he hath done, and many other females of his own creating? Virginia Woolf thought Shakespeare had a man-womanly mind, an androgynous mind. Orson Welles observed that Shakespeare was clearly tremendously feminine. The Cambridge scholar Juliet Dusenberry argues that Shakespeare's drama deserves the name, the name feminist, for in his plays, the struggle is for women to be human in a world that declares them only female. But how did this 16th century playwright come to write feminist drama? The authorship question is a massive game of clue played out over the centuries. The weapon is a pen. The crime is the composition of the greatest works of literature in the English language. The suspects are numerous. The game is played in back rooms and basements beyond the purview of the authorities. Now and then reports of the game surface in the press and the authorities, by which I mean the Shakespeare scholars, are incensed. They come in blowing their whistles and stomping their feet, waving their batons wildly. They denounce the game in the strongest terms, attacking not only the legitimacy of the question, but also the sanity of those pursuing it. Shrieking that there is no game to be played, the authorities overturn the board and send the pieces flying. Their protest is too much. It is so excessive, so disproportionate to its object, that it only confirms for the players the worthiness of their pursuit. When the authorities finally retreat, red-faced and sweaty, exhausted by too much baton waving, the players quietly set the board straight and continue playing, fortified by their oppression like some persecuted religious sect. The game is its own reward, the pursuit of truth and intrinsic virtue, one can get postmodern about the truth. One can argue that the author is merely the creation of various cultural discourses, that, te that texts are continuously remade by the actors that perform them and the readers that consume them. But one cannot get around the fact that some person or persons set those words down on paper. Who done it? Thank you, Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Well, it's a privilege to be here with you all engaged in this debate about the author of this extraordinary body of work that we attribute to William Shakespeare. Uh, to have time to discuss this battle at a time when so many real battles are being waged between people and nations as we speak is a privilege. My overarching reaction to Elizabeth's book is that it is a question, an exploration. She aptly begins the book with a question, the one that she said in her talk, who has the authority to determine the truth about the past? I have three main reflections on the book that I'll share here, and then I'll pass it to Nancy. The first is that when a reader brings herself to a book, she brings her full self. And the broad sweep of history covered in Elizabeth's book cuts across many parts of my life. I'm an Indian American woman. I was born in India, lived in England for a year before my parents settled in a small steel mill town in West Virginia where I grew up. In college, I became fascinated with the mechanism of social change and in law school with constitutional law. I worked at the American Civil Liberties Union and eventually made my way to the ACLU Women's Rights Project that was founded by Ruth Bader Ginsburg in 1972. It's where she carved out her groundbreaking gender discrimination litigation. The founding principle at the ACLU is that the response to bad speech, speech that you find repugnant and offensive, is more speech, not less. More exploration, more rebuttal. Some of the ideas in this book are electric. Why would anyone ever want to dim the electricity of these ideas? 
especially at a time when fewer and fewer students seem to be interested in the humanities. It's a time when we should be encouraging a robust exchange of ideas, not quelling it. Justice Ginsburg shared her view on dissenting opinions, and I always share this quotation with any friend who's lost a case or who finds themselves on the losing side of a debate. Here are RBG's words. Dissents speak to a future age. It's not simply to say, my colleagues are wrong, I would do it this way. But the greatest dissents do become court opinions. And gradually, over time, their views become the dominant view. So that's the dissenter's hope, that they are writing not for today, but for tomorrow. History and the law evolve. We dig deeper. We discover new evidence. We revise our ways of thinking. This adaptability is vital. So to all those Oxfordians out there that Elizabeth referred to, craft your argument in the hopes that one day it will become the prevailing truth. Staying on Supreme Court justices for a moment, Finding a case where Justice John Paul Stevens and Justice Antonin Scalia agreed was rare. They disagreed vehemently on almost all important issues that touch our country. But they both agreed that the man coming out of Stratford-upon-Avon, known as William Shakespeare, was not the author of the body of work attributed to William Shakespeare. The lack of evidence created reasonable doubt. In fact, when you think of all the skeptics over time who have come out against the man from Stratford, and if a bully slanders them by calling them conspiracy theorists or wacky, this group is very reasonable. Some of them Elizabeth referred to. US Supreme Court Justices Stevens, Scalia, Harry Blackman, Sandra Day O'Connor, Lewis Powell, Historian David McCullough, no slouch when it comes to history. Sigmund Freud, authors Henry James, Nabokov, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Mark Twain. Actors Derek Jacobi and Mark Rylance, who are experts on Shakespearean plays. Charlie Chaplin, Helen Keller, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman. In fact, when the New York Times asked novelist Joyce Carol Oates, uh, which writer, living or dead, she'd like to meet, she responded, I'm paraphrasing, we'd probably all want to meet Shakespeare if he wrote all those plays, or somehow acquired them from Mary Sidney, perhaps. <laughs> and staying with Justice Stevens for another moment, um, I found it astounding to see uh, through original letters that Elizabeth read and that she shares in the book, that the justice takes time out of his day to write to a Shakespeare biographer and asks a question that never got answered. Rule number one of being a lawyer uh, in oral argument is answer the question. It's why you're there. Presumably the justices or judges have read the case, they know the facts, but they have outstanding questions. The job of a lawyer is to answer them. So it's astounding that the justice in this correspondence with the biographer asks the questions, uh, he asks one question four times, and it never gets answered. Here is the question he asked. In a 1622 book by a literary critic that listed all the best Elizabethan poets that a gentleman must read, this is a must read list, the critic puts Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, first and makes no mention of Shakespeare at all. This is six years after the actor William Shakespeare from Stratford had died, so the justice was wondering why. Why did this contemporaneous literary critic fail to mention Shakespeare? This correspondence is available to the public and we still have no reply. The second area of the book that moved me deeply are the moments when Elizabeth is at Wilton House Gardens, the setting of productions like Pride and Prejudice, Bridgerton, The Crown, and she's imagining Mary Sidney being there and writing. And then we go from your mind into the great mind of Virginia Woolf where you wonder 
You wonder, was she telling us something about Shakespeare that she dared not say aloud? Was she whispering to her reader, readers? That notion of women whispering to each other over time is a poignant one. They're saying, we've been there. We felt what you feel, we understand, we fought, and you carry on the fight too. Once one quiets the noise and can hear those whispers, they stay with you always. It's like a channel gets opened. This whispering over time isn't just theoretical. It has the power to affect advocacy today. Lessons learned from diverse women over time can unlock answers to inequities and the evisceration of rights that we are experiencing today around the globe. According to the World Economic Forum, we are 131 years away from global gender parity, so the work is far from done. The excavation of women's voices over the ages is the work of the New Historia and other organizations I work with. My final reflection is from the part of the book where Elizabeth outlines research that explains the growth of English literature as a discipline to construct national identity in the late 19th century. English studies as a product served three main goals for the British Empire. It created social pacification at a time when religion was faltering. It subdued women who were agitating for education. And finally, it controlled the empire's colonies. A law called the India Act of 1853 reserved the best paying and most prestigious civil service jobs to those who demonstrated a knowledge of English literature and of course its prevailing god Shakespeare. Civil service exams then compelled schools and universities to teach to the test, as it were. When I think of the ripple effects of that one statute upon millions of Indians being instructed in English medium schools to be eligible for civil service, employment is astounding. My father is an India independence history buff and was not surprised to hear that this was one of the tactics that the British Empire used. It touched my husband's life deeply where his aunt from South India was a Shakespeare professor and devoted herself to the plays. I so wish I could talk to her about uh, the authorship questions. I'd be fascinated to hear what she has to say. Um, so those are my reflections on the book coming from the law um, and my background, and I pass it to Nancy. Uh, well, I too am just thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, Gina. And uh, it's wonderful to be on this panel with these wonderfully brilliant women. And I highly recommend reading Elizabeth's book. It's just, as I've been saying, it's a page turner. It's deeply, um, it's so well researched. It's so engaging. Anyway, like Jamer, I say you should be sure to buy a book before you leave. So Elizabeth's wonderful book highlights some fascinating detective work that has been going on for centuries around the Shakespeare authorship question. It also highlights the gatekeeping and ad hominem attacks within the scholarly community that arise, perhaps from intellectual vices like closed-mindedness or from cognitive biases like confirmation bias that also have been going on for centuries. One of the main motivations for the book, Elizabeth tells us, concerns our interrogations of the past. How do we know what we think we know about the past? And who has the authority to determine the truth about the past? These are questions that I, too, have been exploring. I work in the history of philosophy in the 17th and 18th centuries, so somewhat later than Shakespeare's time. And I'm interested both in what women philosophers of this period thought and wrote about, and in the narratives contemporary scholars create about these thinkers. I'm especially interested in the ways early modern women raised concerns about truth-seeking and inquiry. 
who did they think had the authority to determine the truth about the past and consequently about the present? So let me say a little bit more about this focus of mine. When I was in graduate school, I learned that there were no women in the history of philosophy. No women in the history of philosophy, full stop. When I became a professor of philosophy and did some investigating on my own, both within my discipline and outside it, I discovered that there were scores of women in the early modern period, and even earlier, who were writing philosophical works, and that many of these thinkers were writing explicitly feminist texts. How exciting it was to me to learn about Christine de Pizan's Book of the City of Ladies, published in 1405, Lucrezia Marinella's The Nobility and Excellence of Women and the Defects and Vices of Men, a great title, <laughs> published in 1601, Marie Lejar de Gournier's Apology for the Woman Writing, published in 1626, Mary Estelle's Some Reflections Upon Marriage, published in 1700, and many, many, many other texts, way more than I could possibly list tonight. My excitement in realizing that feminism had been around for a long time turned into a perplexed dismay, however, when I also realized that women had been making the same arguments not only day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year, but century after century, and incredibly, even for a couple of millennia. Why have women's demands, not only for political goods, but also for epistemic goods, gone so thoroughly unheeded? This idea of being unheeded, which I and my colleague Jessica Gordon-Roth are exploring in a book of that title, Unheeded, helped me realize that determining the truth about the past is not only a matter of recovering works that have been forgotten, lost, or coded as unimportant, but it also is, it is also about taking stock of the ways historical women have confronted again and again their invisibility as knowers. So this is one reason why the New Historia is such an important project. It's engaged not merely in female historical recovery, which, by the way, is not nothing, right? It's not nothing to be recovering texts from the past. But in also creating new knowledge, a new knowledge ordering system that ends this cycle of recovery and loss, recovery and loss, of women's contributions to intellectual, literary, political, and artistic life. So let me share with you one example of an early modern woman confronting women's epistemic invisibility. So slightly more than 300 years ago, Mary Estelle published anonymously a work called Some Reflections Upon Marriage. And in the preface to the third edition, which came out in 1706, she addresses the fact that a male writer, unnamed, had declared himself the author of this text, which she had published anonymously. So she writes, "'Tis a very great fault to regard who it is that speaks rather than what is spoken. Bold truths may pass while the speaker is incognito, but are not endured when the speaker is known." So what is she saying? First, she's pointing out that women are often victims of ad hominem attacks. What they say is dismissed with scorn precisely because they, because women say it. Laughter and ridicule, Estelle writes, are set up to drive women from the tree of knowledge. Second, the bold truth she's asserting in the reflections, namely that there is no natural intellectual inequality between men and women, which is the argument that had been put forth at the time, that there was a natural inequality. So this bold truth will not be endured, that is, it will be rejected once it's revealed that she, a woman, is advancing it. And finally, she notes that even if a claim asserted by a woman were to be accepted, somehow the praise for it would fall back onto a man. She writes, the world will hardly allow a woman to say anything well unless she borrows it from men or is assisted by them. End of the quote. So in other words, women's voices have no volume until they are amplified by men's. <laughs> 
So Estelle is suggesting in these passages that women are kind, victims are a kind of epistemic injustice. They're unjustly denied authority as truth seekers and truth tellers. So we might ask, how might this also be true of Elizabeth herself in this text, given the malice that was expressed by some reviewers who saw her exploration of the Shakespeare authorship question as blasphemous? Another very interesting point explored in Elizabeth's book is this figure of the Stratford man as a lone genius. As many scholars would have it, we are to imagine the Stratford man writing the plays and sonnets and so on entirely on his own, collaborating with no one, his genius so astounding, so unnatural, that he did not need more than the grammar school education that he had received, did not need to travel to see the world, to learn languages, but could, just by putting pen to parchment, open the mental floodgates through which gushed the brilliant, and of course I do mean brilliant, works that were attributed to him. Now women are seldom described as geniuses, an omission that has an obvious connection with denying women the status of knower. Let me share with you, though, an excerpt from Mary, I'm sorry, from May Sarton's Journal of a Solitude, which was published just 50 years ago, not 300 years ago, 1973, in which she explores the idea of the woman genius. So she writes that she's just read an essay on Virginia Woolf. We all seem to have Virginia Woolf on our minds tonight. Uh, she's just read an essay on Virginia Woolf by Carolyn Heilbrunn, and she gratefully remarks, what a relief to find an essay that neither sneers at nor disparages Virginia Woolf. She notes that much criticism at the time described Woolf as self-involved or irrelevant. And she continues then with her reflections in the journal. So quoting Sarton now. It's painful that such genius sh should evoke such mean-spirited response. Is genius so common that we can afford to brush it aside? What does it matter whether she is major or minor, whether she imitated Joyce, I believe she did not, whether her genius was a limited one? What remains true is that one cannot pick up a single one of her books and read a passage without feeling more alive. If art is not to be life enhancing, what is it to be? Half the world is feminine. Why is there resentment at female oriented art? Women certainly learn a lot from books oriented toward a masculine world. Why is not the reverse also true? Or are men really so afraid of women's creativity because they are not themselves at the center of creation, cannot bear children, that a woman writer of genius evokes murderous rage, must be brushed aside with a sneer as irrelevant? So Sarton's words echo those of Estelle, the disparagement, the sneering, the dismissal, the claims of irrelevance with respect to a woman writing or speaking. But even before Estelle, such insights were recorded by women thinkers. I'll share one more passage with you from an early modern woman, this one from a text called The Lady's Complaint, written in 1626, so just about 400 years ago, by Marie Lejar de Gournier. So she writes, I ask you, how unjust is the way in which women are usually treated in conversations, insofar as they are included in them at all? I am not afraid to admit that I know this from my own personal experience. If women possessed the reasoning and thoughts of Carneades, Carneades was a Greek philosopher who for a time ran Plato's Academy. So if women possessed the reasoning and thoughts of Carneades, there is no man, no matter how puny he may be, who would not put them in their place with the approval of most of their company when, with merely a smile or a slight nod of the head, his silent eloquence would communicate, it's only a woman speaking. So, to wrap up, the broad question that Elizabeth's book explores, who has the authority to determine the truth about the past, presents us with a challenge well worth considering. How do we embed women's authority as knowers into the cultural consciousness so that 50, 300, and 400 years from now, we are not still having this conversation? Thanks. So, Namita, I know that you had a couple of questions for Elizabeth, so we'll start there. 
I'll ask one question, and I think we'll open it up to hear all of your questions. So Elizabeth, you introduce us to Ross Barber, who is a scholar who questions the authorship ap um, attribution, but she champions the ability to dwell in the space of uncertainty. And then on page 305, Barber tells us that computer programs have struggled to tell apart the works of Christopher Marlowe and Shakespeare stylistically. It made me think, can we sick our finest artificial intelligence on this question, IBM Watson or Microsoft's AI? And can we do what another scholar, Loney, set out to do in 1920? Technological advancement could reveal answers now that have remained shrouded. Is there AI being used to di dissect the text and give it some attribution? Yeah, it's a great question. The, the whole field of sort of looking for co-authors in Shakespeare's plays has a really interesting, interesting history. Um, I mean, the, now they refer to this as stylometry or computational stylistics, uh, looking, using algorithms to tease out hands in the plays. And, and scholars first sort of suspected in the 18th century that there were maybe other hands in these plays, and that might explain why there are some bad passages here, because that can't possibly be Shakespeare. Shakespeare never wrote a mediocre line, must be someone else. Um, so scholars started trying to say, okay, maybe this is Middleton here, maybe this is Johnson over here, Marlowe's somewhere coming in, but at the same time, of course, skeptics were putting forth the other authorship candidates, and this was very dangerous because Actually, if you're saying there are hidden hands in the plays that weren't recognized for centuries, who's to say that Shakespeare's not also a hidden hand? Uh, tricky territory. So there was a, there's a hilarious speech in 1924 where one, one Shakespeare scholar um, thundered against the disintegration, he called it, of Shakespeare. And he said, you know, we, we, we must defend the rock of Shakespeare. In a cycle colonial way, I wonder if he's talking about defending the rock of England, and he talks about the other co-authors as sort of an alien invasion, even though they were all also English. It's a, it's a funny speech, but so that put a stop for most of the 20th century to the search for co-authors because it's just too close to the other heresies um, and they couldn't have that. But now there has been in the late 20th and early 21st century an interest in using technology to try to tease out these hands, but it's a really tricky thing with literature because actually how do you tell when um, it's actually, say, Marlowe in a play, or if it's Shakespeare imitating Marlowe or parodying Marlowe, you know? Um, how do you tell influence and parody and, you know, these other things apart from, from, uh, from another voice actually coming in? So scholars who do these studies, um, they come up with different results often. You know, they, they see different hands in different plays, and uh, funnily, a, a mathematician entered the brawl in, in 2019 and said, come on now, actually all of these methods you're using are mathematically unsound and no one has been able to say so because these English literature scholars actually don't know, you know their mathematics and their computer programming well enough to say that the emperor has no clothes. So there's now a kind of, they are, there, there's an, acknowledg an acknowledgement of co-authors in these plays, but also a kind of, um, you know, deep difficulty about coming to any, any final conclusions about whose hand is in what play. That was a long answer. I just want to ask, um, are you collecting, and you were given to Jane? We're, we're collecting questions. And you pass them along to Jane. Okay. We'll go by so while the questions are being collected, I did have a question for you, Elizabeth. Um, I wonder if you can, have you come across any of the anti-Stratfordians giving an explanation of whether the Stratford man would have, like what might his, re his reaction, or would he have given consent to the use of his name if he was not really the author. Like, uh, sometimes in reading your book, it was almost like to call someone a William Shakespeare meant something. Like, it wasn't just about that name. It was like a, it was a code for something. But any, in any case, what do, do you think that, have they ever said anything about that, what kind of consent he would have given? Well, that's an area where I think the skeptics don't have an answer yet, really. One 
person I interview in the book, Alexander Waugh, an Oxfordian, says, you know, that's the million dollar question. What was the relationship, you know, what was the involvement of, you know, Mr. William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon in this subject? And, I mean, you can sort of tease out possible answers. There was a practice in the period of, instead of just making up a fake name as a pseudonym, of using someone else's name. And there's one writer in 1591 who complains about this practice, and he calls it underhand brokery. And he says there are writers who are paying off someone else to use to, to use their name and put it on their works, and references to things people call a designed name. Um, so that gives you maybe a little clue as to perhaps that was something going on, although we don't know um, for certain in this case. Other people point out, I mean, one, one argument that's made is that Shake Dash Spear, which is how the name often appeared, um, is a rather suggestive name actually, because it invokes it invokes Pallas Athena, um, who was born from Zeus's head, shaking her spear, and she's the, she's the she was invoked often by Renaissance writers as um, as their muse, as the sort of like the, the goddess of poetry of playwriting. Um, they would call on her to so so that name Shake. I mean, it's it's. It's almost a tell, a little bit, as a as a as a name, isn't it? She, it's, an, it's an invocation of Athena. Yeah. Uh, some some would argue. Huh. I won't. Yeah. yeah. And Elizabeth, one question that I sorry. Thank you. One question that I continue to be very interested in, because of the uh, avalanche of um, content being and data being produced by the Global Project of Feminist Historical Recovery. Virginia Woolf says in 1929, as an absolute certainty, no woman in the age of Shakespeare could have written a line of poetry. Now, in fact, even in Elizabeth's, in Virginia's time, there were people trying to recover women who did write poetry. <coughs> but now we have really several candidates, not so much to be Shakespeare, as to perhaps have collaborated with him. So does that enter into any of these conversations? What, what Virginia Woolf's? Well, the fact or? that we know enough now so that there are named women who carry with them because of the research that's been done on them mm. and the conversations about them among scholars, a kind of breadth and depth of identity so that they might be yeah. at least collaborators. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the Elizabethan theater was thought for so long to be an all-male space because the, the playing companies were all boys or men. The, the, the documented playwrights were male. But you have a, there's a Shakespeare scholar, Phyllis Racken, who has said she's absolutely certain women were involved in the theater of the day, but that their names, um, you know, for reasons ranging from commercial marketability to social propriety, could not appear on a play. Um, so she think you know, and, and and thus may be very difficult or impossible to retrieve. But she's convinced that they were contributing to the drama of the Renaissance. And and scholars now are doing incredible research on you know women's involvement in writing in the period. And in in you know in Italy and France, they were even allowed to act, which is really interesting. And some of those troops traveled to England. And what influence did they have? You know, seeing female actresses and some some of the Italian actresses were also writers how what did the English women make of that you know they were writing they were very interested in drama often as patrons of theater companies um, you know as you know contributing to the the costumes and the pageantry of the theater but um, it's an interesting thing that there's a there's this assumption that drama must have been all male just because we don't have women's names documented but the, the, the social pressure of uh, you know of the period to not publish your name um, as a woman you know as a woman writing was so strong back then. There's a fabulous sonnet uh, 
um, where a writer refers to a woman who powder, he says he, she powders a sonnet as she does her hair and prostitutes them both to public air. Mm -hmm. The idea being that to publish a sonnet as a woman was a kind of prostitution, it was immodest. So, so many reasons for concealing your involvement as a woman in writing. And as Phyllis Rackin points out, that doesn't mean women weren't writing, just means that they weren't, you know, they weren't very open about it. <laughs> We have some wonderful questions. Um, so we'll start with this one. Uh, and this is for you, Elizabeth. Um, mm -hmm. uh, how did you come to start this project? How long did it take you? And how did it transform you? How did it transform me? Goodness. <laughs> um, I was an English literature student, a Shakespeare student in um, college and into graduate school. And I loved the plays. I never really, I'd heard that there was this authorship question. You know, I think an English teacher at one point mentioned, oh, some people think it was Marlowe or Oxford. I really didn't pay attention to it. You study the plays, you analyze the plays as a student. But I came back to it later because um, I, I really loved the, Shakespeare's heroines. And I was fascinated by the question of how this male 16th century playwright came to write uh, what Phyllis Ra uh, what Juliet Dusenberry calls feminist drama. How did he do this? And I started reading the Shakespeare biographies, you know, that try to um, explain, as the Shakespeare scholar Stephen Greenblatt's book puts it, how Shakespeare became Shakespeare. And they don't provide very good answers, those books. They're, they're highly speculative because they have to sort of fill um, the gaps with imagination. He could have, might have, must have, should have, probably... Um, and at the same time, I was looking at um, uh, the famous writers over the years who have doubted the authorship, Henry James and Mark Twain and Walt Whitman, and I was really intrigued by the fact that these, um, you know, these pillars of literary history were pretty convinced that this was a pseudonym and there's something else going on here, and that, you know, just knowing that these people, these minds were were interested in, and, and thinking in that direction made me curious, and I, I pursued it. Um, down the heretical rabbit hole. OK, another question. Um, uh, who are the leading women suspects for who could have been Shakespeare? Mary Sidney, the Countess of Pembroke, was um, proposed in 1931 in a kind of group authorship theory. The man who proposed her, an English economist named Gilbert Slater, thought um, she might account for what he saw as the feminine intuition in the plays. And uh, Mary Sidney, was a, she was a patron of writers. She supported writers. She had a sort of writer's salon at her estate, Wilton House. She, when writers credit her with sort of teaching them how to write and will refer to Wilton House as a school, which is you know, really interesting. What was she doing there? Um, she was very interested in writing and drama herself. And when the first folio was published, that's the collection of Shakespeare's plays, it was dedicated to her two sons, which is an interesting connection. So she has cropped up as, um, you know, as a possible contributor to the plays or editor or perhaps you know, um, someone involved in the, in the first folio production. The other woman whose name has become more popular in recent years is Amelia Bassano, and I originally wrote about her in The Atlantic. And she was a London-born daughter of Italian immigrants. And she's interesting because her family has this connection to northern Italy, which is so important in the plays. Um, and in particular, the family was from Bassano del Grappa. Now, of, in 2008, a Shakespeare scholar named Roger Pryor noted that Othello, um, the play Othello, has the, this passage that seems to be referring to a fresco, a very obscure fresco in the town of Bassano del Grappa, Italy. And this scholar, Roger Pryor, was convinced that th this author, Shakespeare, he, he clearly has been to Bassano del Grappa. He has seen this fresco he's describing in this play. Shakespeare must have been to Italy, except, of course, there's no record that the man from Stratford ever left England. And um, so there's, there are a number of interesting connections with the Bassano name there. Uh, could you elaborate on the feminine qualities that Shakespeare had? Maybe this is for all of you. Of the plays, or of what does that mean? The feminine I qualities don't have anything Shakespeare more, had. Um, but I, I would imagine that there was some qualification in in your kind of uh, 
uh, presentation about the plays having feminine qualities, that there were lots sure. of critics who thought they had sort Yeah, of I mean, it's qualities. a running theme over the years. You see this cropping up again and again, first in the 17th century with Margaret Cavendish saying, oh, he must have transformed somehow from a man to a woman to write these female characters. And later in the 1730s, 1740s, when Shakespeare had sort of, the plays had sort of fallen out of popularity, a group calling themselves the Shakespeare Ladies Ladies Society, um, all sort of banded together to, to bring the plays back to the London theaters because women loved Shakespeare so much. And so one of the things, you know, that I think has made Shakespeare so popular over the years that he um, appeals to men as, the plays appeal to men as well as women. And then you get um, the Victorian critic John Ruskin talking about, um, you know, that he says Shakespeare created only um, heroines. He doesn't have heroes. You know, he thought the, the female characters in the plays were so superior and Orson Welles, some of the other writers I mentioned. The, the, the Oxford scholar Anne Barton has noted that Shakespeare's plays seem to have an, she calls it an uncanny understanding of women somehow missing from the work of his fellow dramatists. Um, and I, I quoted Juliet Dusenberry on the feminist, you know, sh the idea that Shakespeare's drama deserves the name feminist. So there is this, this running thing that there's something really remarkable going on with the female characters in the plays and with the plays um, treatment of gender and sexuality generally. You know, the women of the plays are constantly sort of outwitting the men around them or subverting the patriarchal norms of their society, criticizing the, the you know the fathers or the brothers or the uncles or the leaders that are in some way they feel um, suppressing them or controlling them unjustly and they have these fabulous speeches sort of crying out against the misogyny of their day and it's remarkable that so clearly this this author Shakespeare um, saw the misogyny of his time put it up on stage for audiences to sort of uh, critically examine right and he also created characters, female characters, that resist that misogyny. And I think it remains a major unanswered question how, um, how and why this author did that. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> um, we are all familiar with Shakespeare's signature, yet your book shows actual William Shakespeare signatures that are not the signature we've come to know. Where do you think this signature came from? Was it based on the penmanship of the man? And then I can't read the last word. <laughs> Question mark. Anyone want to volunteer the last word? Well, the signatures in the book are the, the that I have in the book are the the only surviving images of the of William Shakespeare's signatures that are known. I mean, the signatures are a fascinating problem. Um, they are all spelled differently. They're they're inconsistent. They um, some of them are sort of scribbled. There was an investigation done by Her Majesty's um, stationary office in 1985 into the matter of Shakespeare's signature because it was so troubling. Um, and the uh, Jane Cox, the, the public records keeper, said that they confirmed her analysis of the signatures confirmed the views of the most extreme anti-Stratfordians and that she thought this was a man who... who um, Quite possibly couldn't write. You know that most most great writer most writers of the period have um, have a, you know a stylized signature, a consistent signature, and that this person did not suggest either that he well possibly that he couldn't write, and that clerks were writing the signature. Um, you know you have to remember in the late 16th, early 17th century, much of the population was illiterate. Um, and you know, so the most extreme anti-Stratfordians will say that this man doesn't even have a recorded education, and we don't even have any evidence that he could write. Uh, so the signatures are are quite a touchy, a, a touchy area of the authorship debate. Uh, for Elizabeth, what was the most surprising thing that happened during the writing of your wonderful book? The most surprising thing, I suppose, were the interviews I did for the book, because I, I interviewed a number of Shakespeare scholars, I interviewed various skeptics, and it made it a, a, a sort of a journey for me throughout, because I didn't, you know, you can't control interviews. You might have questions planned, but you don't know exactly what direction they're going to go in, how people are going to respond, um, who's going to talk to you or not, 
And um, you know, one interview I do with Sir Stanley Wells, one of the great Shakespeare authorities, we had, we had set up the interview, I arrived in Stratford, and he emailed me the night before our interview saying, I've, I've just discovered you're an anti-Shakespearean, he said. This is a phrase they use to sort of smear anyone who questions the authorship as being somehow against Shakespeare. Uh, and and you know, I, he said, I, I should prefer not to meet with you. So, you know, I had to think, do I, okay, do I just give up? Do I just drop this here? And I wrote back, you know, saying, look, I, I love the works of Shakespeare. I don't see, why well, I've read your books. You know, he's written books on this subject. On, he wrote a, a edited book called Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, you know, trying to put the question to rest, no doubt. Um, you know, you, you can't have written books on this subject and engaged in the, in the debate around it and then refuse to be interviewed. That's not a very uh, scholarly, I mean, you can refuse, but it looks a bit silly, doesn't it? So, um, you know, I, I finally said, look, if you don't like my questions, you can chuck your tea at me. And that seemed to help things. So he agreed to meet finally, and we had about a two-hour conversation in Stratford-upon-Avon, you know, in Shakespeare's hometown, birthplace. Um, and it's a really sort of a tense con conversation and um, really interesting and, and surprising answers he gives to some of the questions I posed to him. So all the, all the interviews along the way were surprising, and the book I had to you know the book sort of writes itself as you're doing the interviews because you don't know you know what people are going to say and what direction it's going to go. And one of the interviews I really wanted to do with um, the Columbia professor James Shapiro, the Arch Shakespeare defender, um, I wanted to end the book with him, final big interview, and he refused to meet me, would not talk to me. So you know, I put his refusal in the book because I actually I think that's that's sort of part of the story, the refusal of some scholars to even engage on this subject. But then what I what I did do is I went to the Folger Shakespeare Library and I read his correspondence with Justice John Paul Stevens, and I think it's a fascinating correspondence. And so his voice is very much in the book, um, and he's there despite his refusal to engage in any kind of dialogue. Um. How do you recommend mobilizing recovered feminist knowledge to create tangible changes in the epistemic and literal violence against women and other minoritized groups in the present? Oh, repeat that one for yeah, me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. How do you recommend mobilizing recovered feminist knowledge to create tangible changes in the epistemic and literal violence against women and other minoritized groups in the present? It has to be incorporated into the way um, history and literature and any field is taught, you know, so you can't just have, there, there is this, uh, Nancy referred to the cycle of remembering and forgetting, you know, women's hit stories are, are, are recovered, you know, there's a great biography written about someone or someone, you know, a book on hidden figures or something like that, and then they sort of get um, forgotten again and they're not incorporated into school curriculum, you know, the books don't make it onto syllabi, whatever, they're not, you know, because they change then those stories, when they're recovered, they actually change the histories as they've been written, and so it, it, it creates such a dissonance then to have to to have to reformulate the history we thought we knew, that they 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 sort of get added in briefly and then you know forgotten again or thrown out. So there has to be a real you know girls and boys in schools need to um, be learning this right as they're growing up and informing their views of the world and of gender, and um, I, I think that's. That's the way you combat it through education. That's the way you mobilize it, I should say. Actually, you don't mind. Yeah, no, please, please, please chime in. I do have something to add to that. Um, I mean, I totally agree with Elizabeth. This is one of Gina's projects to, you know, be thinking about curricula matters and so on and so forth. And you know, I shared those excerpts with you from like hundreds of years ago to say. Like in that time, women were asking questions very much like the questions we ask, or presenting positions very much like the positions we pr we present. Of course, their context is different, but it's it, there's still very similar kind of questions arising. But I do feel like what you know what we see is there's a lot of resistance in the world whenever there's a. I mean, your book is entirely about how resist how much people want to resist a story, a narrative that's just not the narrative we've always had or people have always imagined that we've had. So when we try to do this, you know, adding, changing curricula and so on, I mean, we see every day the resistance this, that we come, we come up against. So I think, you know, I've been thinking more lately that 
we have spent so much time like thinking that the problem is we have to make our arguments better. Like it's our side, right? We've got to make it clearer. We have to make it better. We can't have any fallacies. We can't go wrong in any way. And of course, that's true. I mean, it is the responsibility of the speaker, if you will, or the the one who's wanting to suggest these kind of changes to present the best position you can present. But there is also, a, you know, a kind of um, responsibility, an epistemic responsibility uh, from the other side as well, right? That. He, others have to develop certain kinds of, I would say, intellectual virtues, which enable them to be more open-minded, more thoughtful, more able to listen, more able to see things from different kinds of points of view, right? It's not, these are the skills that also have to be developed, not just the informing, not just the getting of the story out there. This one's a longer question, and I'm going to start with what they actually wrote. Jamer, I apologize for my writing. You can paraphrase, <laughs> so thank you. Your writing's better than mine. Uh, Shakespeare's plays have been thought to be written by a group of actors. Plays like Pericles sound and pace differently from plays like Hamlet or Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, I'm interested in the idea of the solitary genius. Today, the idea of solitary genius is still upheld and mostly seen as a man in popular culture. Why is the public so enamored by the solitary genius? Uh, why does this idea persist? Because it's romantic. And we romanticize the past, and we like romantic stories about the past. I mean, I think that's the main attraction of the traditional um, authorship theory. You know, it's, it's a rags to riches tale of a boy who sort of comes from nothing and raises himself up you know, through words to become the greatest writer in the English language, even though we don't know quite how he did it, and it's all a bit supernatural and mysterious, but somehow he did it, and um, people love that story. The political scientist George Lakoff refers to the rags to riches narrative as one of, um, as a deep narrative sort of embedded in our culture. You, you see it in fairy tales, in religious stories, in the campaigns of charismatic politicians i came from nothing and now look you know look at me so it's it's a very attractive story um but the shakespeare story resembles the sort of the archetypal narrative of the hero's journey if you know the joseph campbell book the hero's journey and it's um it's it's mythic really the, that tale of the solitary genius and our emotional attachment to it makes it very difficult to examine critically because we like the story. Hard to give up a story that you really like. Should we do one more question? As many as, yeah, here. sure. Um, what does it mean for the concept of Shakespeare being a woman to be a heresy? Are we as women still feeling as though we have to defend our worth this way? Or was this title chosen to exemplify the crisis of increasingly public female authority? Heresy comes from the treatment um, that, that the question about authorship, um, you know, the reactions that you get to the question from scholars, and, and they re have referred to it historically as heresy, and they sort of treat anyone questioning um, the traditional attribution as a heretic. And I mean, I'm also referring to the sense in which the, the religious quality of the of the Shakespeare story. You know, it is it is deeply actually religious in nature. Stratford became this kind of English Bethlehem that people worshipped at, and and Shakespeare a kind of English Christ figure that united a nation um, that had been divided for so long between Catholics and Protestants. You can all come sort of behind the behind this national unifying God. So the the Shakespeare story is is has. A deeply religious element to it and the reactions to doubting Shakespeare are not unlike the reactions you might see in the 19th century to those who are questioning the divinity of Christ, you know, being smeared as heretics. So it's, it's a similar kind of phenomenon. Um, it is, I, suppose, I mean, the woman thing is, of course, it's a provocative title. Um, and yes, of course, it's heretical to suggest that Shakespeare might have been a woman because Shakespeare is sort of one of the, the, the father gods of Western culture, you know, um, one of the massive towering men that everyone learns about growing up. And so to, to 
imagine a woman involved somehow in the in the creation of those works um, involves such a sort of a radical rethinking of what we thought we knew about the past and about genius and about um, the people who who shape our culture that it it does I think it is received as a heresy a lot of the time perhaps it shouldn't be but that is the reaction I think we I think we need to end now, um, and I'm delighted that Mary Watson, the executive dean of the Schools of Public Engagement at the New School, is here to make some closing remarks. You have been really a wonderful audience. Um, this was really an engagement in Elizabeth's book and the many, many issues that it raises and reflects because um, it's a story about truth. So Mary. Thank you, Gina. Uh, Elizabeth, um, I'm sorry that I had to arrive late because of another engagement, so I didn't get to hear your comments, So I, um, but I did get to hear the end of the panel here. So thank you all for doing um, this event and also for um, Elizabeth of writing this book. You know, I've often, you know, wondered how many generations it will take until we talk about um, the notion of feminism, the notion of um, gender and its binary, the notions of um, the concealing of um, identities and the and the hidden talents of women. And um, for some reason, when you were talking, I kept thinking about Barbie. So let me just say something about Barbie. <laughs> Um, so what's interesting about Barbie is I don't know why people are interested in the Barbie movie um, because to me this is a story that's been told for a very long time and the idea that it's fresh and new and maybe you know worth a billion dollars or whatever to tell the story about discovering patriarchy and trying to work in a way to um, to reverse that although it's I suppose cleverly done by reversing the genders that this would somehow be perceived as new, and yet many, many, many thousands, you know, perhaps millions of young female-identified girls um, are finding this to be a, revel a revelatory movie. And um, so um, I really think that this work is still relevant and still as important as um, it was earlier. Um, uh, just a final quote on Barbie. I, I know that um, Ruth Handler, who was the inventor of Barbie, I watched the Barbie documentary, which is called Tiny Shoulders, which I thought was a very interesting title. Um, so Ruth invented Barbie in 1959, and she really wanted Barbie to be a, a feminine career person, so to, to break the stereotypes of, um, of gender that we had. Um, in, in the interview in the film, um, the, um, her husband, I believe, um, says, was, is asked the question, if Ruth was the inventor of Barbie, why is the company named Mattel? And he said, well, my partner's name was Matt, and my name is Elliot, and that sounded good, and Ruth didn't really sound good in the name of a company. So I think this is, as I say, a tale as old as time. It's really a repeated story in many generations, in many iterations, in many um, commercial enterprises, um, and in many legacies of the mystique of what you know constitutes greatness and excellence and good writing. So I really um, think that this um, work is very relevant for this current time. Um, I also think that the um, way in which we think about gender is changing, um, and not so much in the binary way, but um, in the non-binary non lenses and through multiple gender identities. Um, and I was struck by the cover here, how much this reminds me of it could have a very different title because uh, the idea of gender transformation is actually meaning something quite different in our society today. So um, I, um, I welcome this exploration of this kind of work and really think that it's extremely timely to deconstruct the canonical ways we think about literature and in the ways it can only be written by men. And I actually remember the first time I heard about you know, perhaps Shakespeare was a woman when I uh, went to Gina uh, Walker came to my office and brought the 
VR goggles that were, she had developed a, a, a version of the New Historia, which was done in virtual reality. And she, I put the goggles on and she walked me through the virtual reality. And I got to William Shakespeare and she led me to the female authors that were supposed to have. And then she led me to a hundred other of these connections of where the ideas that women had had were then later picked up and recognized and written about and popularized and monetized by these various authors. So there's many, many, many of these stories. And so I just want to say that's the reason that I'm so you know, happy that we have Gina Walker, who is a force, if you don't know her, of nature, um, and um, you know, a person who has really spearheaded this New Historia project. Um, her work you know, it's very much in the tradition of the pivotal founding mothers of the New School, which I'm sure she has told you about before my arrival tonight. Um, she has really um, been a, um, unrelenting in the way she has been committed to uncovering these kinds of stories, unrelenting in the way she celebrated these critical contributions that women have made to human history. And she really, through the New Historia Project, brings critical urgency to it. So. Um, I think that if we're going to live progressive values, we have to currently interrogate um, our assumptions and what we think we know. This is uncomfortable, but that's what we do here at the New School. And so I invite you to join Gina and her collaborators if you're not already part of the New Historia, because you may not yet know this, but you too can write a woman's history um, for the New Historia Project. Gina is always actively recruiting uh, um, authors who can, um, who can contribute to what Gina aspires to be, uh, all the uncovered histories of all the women in history, which is a big project. So she needs a lot of authors. <laughs> and there's a lot of them already done. And you can really pick whoever you want, so that's interesting. Um, so thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing your book, and to Namita and Nancy for your stories and insights on the panel. I'd also like to thank the Bachelor's Program for Adult and Transfer Students and the Creative Writing Program who co-sponsored this event and our comms team, our student assistants, our new public engagement fellows, some of whom are here tonight, uh, and our various um, vendor partners. But most of all, Gina Laurie Walker, Laurie Walker and her collaborators for bringing the new Historia here. Um, in closing, I just want to say that um, it's been a complicated few days, as I think you know about what's happening in the conflict um, in Israel and Gaza, and I just want to say a few words of recognition of the pain and suffering that the innocent folks who are being um, uh, living through this situation right now are on all of our minds. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a, a difficult time, as there always are difficult times, but the the power, as uh, Elizabeth said, of education and finding out the truth of stories and understanding more of what's behind them is really what inspires us here as a new school. And so we welcome you to come back anytime. Thank you. Thank you.